It's Zandra Pollard with It's Where I Am. Today, my guest is 42-year veteran, female prop master, Hope Parrish. We're going to talk about how to keep Hollywood safe on the set. As we all know, the unfortunate incident involving Alec Baldwin on the movie Rust, um, unfortunately, Elena Hutchins uh, was shot and killed by an unsafe firearm. And also director Luis Souza Souza uh, was injured. So we're gonna bring Hope in and she's gonna tell us what are the proper protocols, how to keep the set safe and what's going on also with the strike. Hello, Hope, thank you for being here. Hi, Zandra, how are you? I'm well, so I appreciate you coming on the show. I mean, you've done movies like Django, which is one of my favorites, X-Men, Terminator 3, Congo, The Aviator. I mean, the list goes on. So you know what you're talking about. Um, you are one of the first female uh, females in the industry, one of the first five. Uh, when did your career start? Tell us what a prop master is exactly and what they do. Uh, let's start with your background. Um, thank you. Um, well, I'm a third generation property master. Uh, my father and my grandfather were both prop masters in Hollywood. My uncle was also a prop master. My cousin was a set dresser and my mom's father was a studio welder. So it was kind of a family business. And okay. In 1979, uh, about two years after high school, I was just approaching 21. I, they were pulling people off the street to come work at Universal. And I got that call in 1979 on my way to a Halloween party uh, about this time in 1979. And uh, I got my 30 days. In those days, we had a tier system where much like the Teamsters, where you had the three, two, one uh, process. And um, I was not the first female, but my mentor, uh, who was, I had met in 1974, Emily Ferry, she actually uh, was the first uh, female to be allowed into Local 44 by suing the local uh, oh, wow. in 1977, yes. So a couple of years later, I come in and I wanted to make my dad proud. I just wanted to do what my dad did. I'd been on so many movie sets as a kid and um, traveled all around the world with my father when he would go on location. And it was just something that I knew I wanted to do. And he told me, and Emily also told me that this is going to be a difficult challenge because it really is a boys club and they don't want women in these positions. Um, but I knew early on that I would need to learn as much as I could um, of what the job description would be in order to do it right and make my dad proud. I think for me, it was about, I mean, my biggest critic was my father. My biggest judge was my father. And so, and keeping the respect that he gained through his career was important to me also. Um, as I began kind of Working on shows, I, I worked as a set dresser, I worked as a prop assistant, I worked as a property master eventually with 5,000 hours and the grouping system, which eventually went away in 1985, 86, they, the studio system was, was kind of set aside. And, um, but I found that, you know, in order for me to do the films that I wanted to do, my father did Patton, he did, you know, Gangs of New York, not at that time, but Patton and Sand Pebbles and, I knew that I needed to uh, learn every aspect of what it was to be a property because master. Because you had something to prove. And you, like, you know, uh, Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, you started around the same age. Uh, you were about 21. Uh, she's 24. Um, but the handling of uh, the work job or, you know, the scope and what you're supposed to do, what are the protocols that are in place? Because you were explaining to me before that there's like a four page document that you have to follow. 
Can you tell us about that? What is that called? You're supposed it to is, review it. It's an industry-wide uh, memo that, uh, safety memo that, uh, and there's probably a reason it's safety bulletin number one, because it's all about weapon safety and the property master's ability to maintain uh, control of the weapon with and or with an armorer. It is always under the direction of the property master through historically uh, to acquire the weapons, read the script, acquire the weapons, hire the proper crew, make sure that the gun safety is practiced. And for me, um, you know, I, I didn't play with guns when I was a kid. Um, I, I like to go out and target shoot and things like that. But what I did was I spent time, I, I got this TV show called China Beach and it was World War, it was Vietnam War and weapons involved. Now it's a television show, so there's not a lot of gunfire, but we had quite a bit. And I made sure that I spent a lot of time at Stembridge Gun Rentals at the time, breaking down guns, having a good understanding of how they work. What is the danger zones? What is safety? What is not safe? To the point where Harry Lou, our, our, my, my favorite armors, would literally blindfold me and say, okay, tear this gun down and put it back together. I'm, I couldn't do that today. I'm not a weapons expert. That's not my job description. I'm a property master that has a full understanding of how to run a safe set. Um, the safety bulletin outlines completely what you need to do with safety meetings, attaching the bulletin to the call sheet, um, the protocols of how a weapon, when it's rented, going to the prop truck, getting in the gun safe, and how it goes to the set, how it's presented to the actors, um, which, again, I speak to all actors prior to film, filming, the beginning of filming, to find out what their knowledge is about guns. Sometimes you can look on IMDb now and say, oh, wow, you know, so-and-so did this movie. He understands a little bit. But I can't trust that. So I would always make sure that our actors um, under, had a good understanding or fear. What what are your fears about this? Um, sure, because you mentioned that um, Reese Witherspoon had a little fear of weapons, right? No. Oh, no. sorry. Who was that? Um, Julie Roberts had a little more fear of, of weapons. Okay. Reese 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 is pretty much a good handler, but she. Oh, okay. But what we did was when I started uh, this little film with her and um, uh, uh, Sofia Vergara in New Orleans, I met with Reese at ISS, a prop house that we use in Los Angeles, which is pretty much a national prop house now. Um, we went over gun safety with her, my armorer, Larry Zanoff. Um, we explained to her the workings of the gun. We taught her how to stand because Larry has military experience. We taught her how to stand like a policeman, how to handle her gun as a policeman, what they would do so that she had a really good understanding of it long before we ever went to New Orleans to begin filming. So now I have a question, Hope. Are actors, um, do they get any type of gun training before they start a movie? Is it required to have a gun safety class, let's say, before doing a film? I think depending on the project and depending on the actor uh, would determine how much you might have. You might say, hey, listen, let's get you out to ISS and let's run this through with you. Um, I'm all for uh, having little dates that you set up with production and the first date to directors. A lot of times they may show up to the, uh, the training session, um, but I feel it's a really good to, let's work out some of the fears and the bugs prior to getting onto the movie set. And then that way that person has a good understanding. And they're also taught weapon safety, finger off the trigger, you know, and also they're taught that they need to see what's in that gun when it's being handed to them. If it's an empty gun, if mm. there's dummies in it, if, if there's dummies in it, usually because like, like on this project, the gun is supposedly pointing towards the camera in a, in a revolver, you have a cylinder and you need to make sure that those uh, spaces in that cylinder are filled with a lead. So it looks like the gun has ammo in it. And, um, so you would show them that we're not firing, we're putting dummies in this gun, and it would have a, it, it looks just like a bullet, but it's the, the 
the, the, bar, the bottom of the bullet where the, the firing pin is, is, is punctured. It's hit. Okay. It's hit. Then you know you got a dummy. And a lot of times you'll shake it and inside there'll be a bead. And then, you know, you're dealing with a Hollywood dummy. So your job is to do all of that stuff. And then you pass it to the actor. You say cold gun. Does the actor still then check the gun themselves? You're handing them an a, a gun when it's a cold gun, when the gun is empty. There is nothing in the gun. Okay. That's a cold gun. There's not even any dummies in it. There's nothing in it. Okay. Unfortunately, and I don't really want to get into the specifics of this because there's so much that is still un under investigation. Yes, sure. It, it, it's so unknown. But on my previous sets, that if we were to ha have, you know, hand a cold gun to the actor, I would have the revolver open, my finger through it, let him see down the barrel. Sometimes I'll have a flashlight and shoot um, my flashlight up the barrel so that they could see the light coming through the other side so that they know that the, that the barrel is clear. Not only the, 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 the bar barrel, the, the cylinder of the gun with you know, the, all the different slots for the blanks or the dummies or the whatever you're using uh, are clear if the gun is supposed to be clear. If you're shooting a scene where you have, uh, you're firing three rounds and they're full loads in no matter what gun you're firing, whether it be an automatic, a pistol, a rifle, a machine gun, it doesn't matter. How, you always say the count of how many loads of blank ammunition okay. are in the gun. So you say 10 loads. Full load. Half, okay. You know, a half load is a lighter load than a full load. A quarter load is a lighter load than a half load. Because that way the sound man knows what he's also doing because he's got his headphones on. If you put a full load in here and he's got those pots open, he's going to blow his eardrums out. So now, you were talking about the safety of even the horses, um, like in the movie Django, which the what you know, I said, I loved it. You were telling me you have to pack the, the horse's ears. Absolutely. The, it's not just safety for the crew, the cast and yourself. It's also safety for any animals that are on the set under the humane guidelines. We have to follow those guidelines as well. That's another attachment that goes to the call sheet when you have animals present on the set. And it was important for us, like on Django, to pack the ears of the, of the horses and make sure they're far enough away um, with cotton to protect the horse's ears. So that's a standard practice that we do. Um, when it comes to gunfire on set with animals. And I don't want to just stop at Django. We know you've done many more like Basic <laughs> Instinct, Congo, the Aviator. You've done some of Hollywood's biggest blockbusters. So it is an honor to have you here and uh, give us your expertise on how to keep the set on Hollywood safe. Um, also, I wanted to go into... Uh, the, the strike. So this incident that happened, you know, we understand that there were corners that were being cut, obviously, um, but it also started due to unsafe conditions and uh, union workers walking off. There is a strike that is in process um, in Hollywood. Who are some of the people who are striking and why? Well, that's a lot a big question. It's a national strike. Okay. He said every IATSE members, the International Alliance of Stagehand Theatrical Employees. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, the International Alliance of Theatrical Stagehand Employees all want a little better condition compared to what they were willing to offer us as our new contract. Um there's been long negotiations this summer, uh, countless hours for our business representatives and our New York uh, leadership. And this affects every state in the union that has an IOTSE uh, hall. Alone. It affects the Ruta to the Tuta because it even affects my husband. You know, he's in transportation and, uh, you know, in the industry. And so, even though his particular union isn't striking, it's gonna affect everyone from top to bottom. I have a friend who's doing a movie right now. 
he's not going to get his editing done if the strike happens, right? So it's a really big deal. It's going to affect everybody. It's going to affect him. viewers who want to watch, you know, their next up and coming season of a show. This is true. And part of the problem with the contract was um, the new media. The, 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 the way we view films these days, and, and especially through COVID, is through streaming. And yes. part of the biggest issue, and the pie is only so big, but unfortunately, in my opinion, we're, we're a little top heavy with distribution of, 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 of wealth. And um, the people, such as myself that have been in the union have worked countless hours and um, dedicated their lives to their career, felt like they were not getting a piece of that pie because we weren't, they were taking the pie away. They were taking the new medium away from us. Right. Streaming was taken off the plate, which is a big deal for us to receive that money. Also the hours, I mean, I can't tell you how many shows where I've worked a 17, 18 hour day yes. at five in the morning and you're driving home in LA in bumper to bumper traffic for two hours just to get back to your bed. And then you're turning around in hours from stage to stage or 10 hours from location to location. And if you're an off production employee, you have an eight hour turnaround. Transportation, eight hour turnaround. So a long time ago, quite a few years ago, um, there was a film that I can recommend to most people that Haskell Wexler, a cinematographer, bless his soul, who was just one of the best men I, I came across in my career. He made a film called Who Needs Sleep? And it was all about the hours that were being uh, worked and the not lack of hours in between breaks and, and days of work. And many people had died at the hand of a, of a short turnaround and long hours and enough was enough. And so he did a video documentary that kind of spelled it out and people kind of paid attention to it for a little bit, but then with all the new studios and um, the new, you know, a, a new studio is Amazon, a new studio, just like Warner Brothers or Fox or Paramount, a new studio is Netflix. Um, they are considered the producers. They are the studios. and. I think that I'm with my union rep, my union members, they need to share the wealth. We're there not just to make a paycheck, but we're there to dedicate a future in retirement to, you know, this is a career. This is not just a, a part-time job. And don't be cheap and don't cut corners because that's how accidents happen. Right. I think, yeah, well, and, and hiring, because you know, there's another thing going on with all the new media going on and the demand for content there's a lack of experienced personnel and that is a big problem mm -hmm. we need uh to be more proactive in our area standard areas of, of you know georgia the, the not the big three chicago new york and and uh, los angeles but our new uh community of filmmakers that not so much new but newer to Georgia, to Louisiana, Pennsylvania. Right. Those areas, they need to, they're mixed locals. And the problem with a mixed local is that tomorrow you could be an electrician, yesterday you were a, a, a wardrobe person, you know, oh, you can wow. be for different jobs. Okay. I feel, and many of my peers feel the same way. It's time that the other guilds that are in the IOTC recognize the difference of the responsibility of what a property master and their armorer are to that. And that you can't just interchange that position. There's a reason- There should always be a property master on set, correct? That is correct. And As that ensures safety. And, 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 and I was one of those prop masters because of the time and, and they didn't cut as many corners maybe, or the budgets were a little more plentiful, um, that I was able to be on set every day alongside my director, along with my cast, along with my crew, so that everybody knew what was going on. I never expected my crew to, to answer difficult questions. That's my job. I'm there to protect my crew. I'm there to protect the, 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 the show. And the many years and the way that I was taught through my father and the people before me, which 
a lot of people don't have that opportunity to have what I have, right. which is, which is hard um, for them. But I, I listened to those people and I did it. I always made sure I was on, on set. And if I was on the prop truck, my radio was in my ear. I was within should, you know, distance. I had my buyer would go out and do the running off the set, things like that. Um, well, you know, because of this um, unfortunate um, happening on the Rust uh, set, uh, some of the uh, shows that are like crime shows and such, they're switching over to uh, plastic or rubber guns. Is that correct? Airsoft. Um, a friend of mine uh, who's a prop master here in Los Angeles, Nicole Ruby, her show from the gate, quite a few, you know, since she started her show, there was no gunfire, but people had a lot of weapons on them. They had their sidearms or they had a machine gun or if they were SWAT, whatever, but they didn't have gunfire. So in her uh, as a property master, she made the decision that no real guns were necessary. So she had the airsoft, Sarah, and the replica guns and in holstered, if they're not unholstering the gun, maybe a good looking rubber in there. So there are situations where people before this uh, incident had actually already began doing things like that because okay. unlike me, I, when I was starting out in the eighties, the rules were so different and the, the weapons uh, safety guidelines are exactly the same. But I chose to have all my weapons permits. I was uh, ATF uh, certified, uh, Department of Justice, Department of Justice California, COE list in, Los An in California. And that was my choice because I wanted to make sure that if there were weapons on my set that I was in control right. as a property master is listed in safety bolt number one. I wanted to be able to do my job. And being one of the first women, I mean, isn't that, wasn't there a lot of, a lot of pressure to make sure that you knew everything that you're supposed to know in your field? Let's just say if I didn't do my job better than the guy standing next to me. You wouldn't have it. I, I don't think I would have gotten the jobs, but because I had the strength and conviction, because I knew what my job description was, I read that the property master's description hundreds of times. I've debated what was my job and somebody else's job. I knew my job inside and out. And many a times people have said, oh, we're going to do the shot. And I'd look at it and look, you know, gunfire scenes, clear and present danger, the kill scene. I was doing second unit and I'm like, no, I don't think this is safe. And at the end of the day, you can get a lot of recall. People will push back on a woman. But I stood firm. Listen, I got the piece of the truck. We, this is not safe. You have to move the camera or you have, and you have to be strong enough to say that, you know, a lot of times when we, as women are, you know, trying to, we're in a field and, and we're one of the few, you know, sometimes we might be afraid or intimidated to say something, Well, you can't be that way. You have to speak up and say safety is paramount. You know, I was always, I was always prepared that if I, in the good of the film, and, the, and, and following my job description, if I was fired because I did the right thing, so be it. Yes. Now, what do you think about, so think back to your earlier days, you're like 20 something years old, you know, you're this prop master, uh, gotten the help of your father and your grandfather over the years. So you, you, you came in knowing a lot. I came in knowing an awful lot, but I'll tell you what, my dad, Unlike being his son, I couldn't work with my dad for the first 10 years. Oh. I did a show with my dad, a couple of shows with my dad. Okay. Young as a young assistant. And then he's like, I gotta kick you to the curb because you have to build your own name because you're a woman. Oh wow. And I was so angry at the time. Because I naturally and thought, like, so you know, hurt. you were sitting up under daddy, you really know, at work every day. So that yeah, that's surprising. No, he did the right thing. And I didn't understand it at the time. I was a little resentful. And I was really resentful that I wasn't his son because I wanted to work alongside my dad. So that and I did myself and I made my name and I fought my battles. And I always had him that I could call at night and say, dad, this is what happened today. What do you think? And he's like, certain things, he would guide me with the best of his, his, of his wisdom, you know? And we never, we weren't rebel rousers. We just did our job reported to work and 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 at the end of the day 
my reputation became one with the few women that were in the industry at the time during the position, um, which by the way, there were other prop masters that I met later that worked in Texas and in different places that today are the best in their field. And they joined our union in the 90s. But in the 80s, um, I just had to grow strength. And I could go to my dad and say, listen, they're, 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 they're giving me a hard time about this. What should I do? And he would tell me what to do. And staying professional, following the guidelines, following exactly what your job description is, you can never lose. Right. Especially, especially when it comes to uh, things that you're afraid of. I mean, I did a lot of weapons pictures. I love guns. I have no problem with, with weapons. But deep down inside, every scene, I had that nervous stomach. It was like, uh, because even though you're double checking yourself and triple checking yourself and you're doing the safety meetings, you're showing the first AD, you're opening the gun or you're, you're showing how many, doing the, everything right, there's still this fear that the gun might activate, you know, stovepipe, or maybe there's a obstruction that happens because something gets into the barrel by, you know, with, something happens. And so I always had this, not fear, but this unsettling thing. I was never confident that, or too cocky. Okay. Weapons. I was, it, it was by the book. I think you were mentioning that uh, even if there's some sort of distraction or anything, you have to start over. Like what, you have to start over the process of um, showing the gun and making sure that it's safe. If there's a five minute break, you have to restart, right? Absolutely. So, uh, you know, no matter how it, many years you've been doing, it sounds like you have to still continue to follow that. Um, what is that four page safety? Well, the, proto the safety protocol, protocol, the safety, the safety guideline, the safety bulletin number one, the protocols in which we base our day on when you're using weapons is such that I could, we can show the weapon to the actor, show it to the first aid. I mean, the chain of command is me. It comes from my gun safe to my cart, locked up to the set. I am now preparing. I'm watching a rehearsal. I give an actor a replica or a rubber. If there's two or three actors doing their thing, they all work with rubbers to work it out. Okay. I never give them a loaded gun until we're actually ready to shoot the film. You know, that's the thing. There's no need for anyone to ever have a live. And when I say live, I'm talking blank ammunition because never, ever have I ever in my career or my father's career had a need for live ammo, which is real ammo on the set. And it's clearly stated, it is not allowed anywhere within the vicinity of a movie set, a sound stage. which by the way, a ranch out in the middle of nowhere is a movie set. So right. No horseplay. It says clearly in the bulletin, no horseplay. You can't go out and target shoot at lunch. That's just not, that is unheard of. It's unethical. And so, well, and so on, at the end of the day, you follow the guidelines, you're going to have no problems, you know, and that's why these are here. But if, if you were to say, okay, we're ready to shoot, I hand, getting ready to hand the weapon off to an actor, and I've done all my safety protocols, I've shown them, I've done how many loads, what it's going to be, this, the, if it's a full half or quarter, all of that happens in play. And all of a sudden the director says, wait, stop. What if we did... Now the gun comes, is still in my possession. The gun is, comes back to me. I have to, again, tell everyone what is in that gun. And if it changed what's in this gun, I have to, again, make that happen and also report exactly what is going to happen in that weapon during the time of film. Well, there it is. And that's how you keep Hollywood safe on the set. Thank you so much, Hope, for being here. Um, let's have you back on on a more positive light note uh, and I want to thank, exactly. thank you so much and I want to thank my 91.5 jazz and more listeners for tuning in and as you know I'm here every second Saturday of the month at 8.30 a.m. You can find me 
on itswhereiam.com. Check out this show and the many others we have. And we'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye.